then the class is in memory of Jared Orchen. And today we're learning Parshas Bechukoisai. It's on page, in this book, 826. It's the end of Chumash Vayikra. But before we talk about what we learn the Parsha, the word Bechukotai itself tells, tells a story. The word Bechukotai is more than one meaning. Chok means law. In general, it talks about a law. In the Torah, there is also a few types of laws. In general, you can divide it in two. Laws that make sense, laws that have a reason, and laws that do not have a reason. Um, um, uh, 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 an example of a law that has a reason is I know your father and mother. An example for a law that does not have a reason is a bris, kosher, all these mitzvahs, purity, mikveh, all these mitzvahs are laws that do not have a reason. Now, a chok, even a chok could be a law, a general name for all the laws, but in particular, it talks about laws that do not have reasons. Would a chok be almost all ritual laws? I mean, do you divide it that way? Ritual laws, yeah, you can divide um, No. It, it makes that, sense, that, but that not, not red effer. That's a ritual law, yeah. yeah. He's right. But there is ritual laws that make sense. You not necessarily will come up with them. I mean, eating matzah is a ritual law, but it make, we, have a we have a logical reason because the Jewish people ate matzah when they left Egypt. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't come up with a seven-day celebration. I mean, one piece of matzah would make it. <laughs> one night would be more than enough. Then, it's, but after God did it, you know why? You know, I mean, it makes sense. That's called actually a dut mitzvahs or uh, testimonial laws. There is really, if you go and divide it, you really divide it into mm -hmm. three laws. You know what I mean? There is laws that completely do not make sense, do not have a reason, like like family purity, like like a, a breeze or but even this there is small reasons. There is also we have no reasons. Laws that after the God gives you the reason, you understand it, but you wouldn't come up with them on your own. And laws that you wouldn't even God would never tell you that you would also do it, like honoring your father and mother, like the loss of modesty, thing, and so on and on. Not to steal, not to kill. How is that reconciled with Rambam, who gives a reason for everything, basically? For everything? He gives a reason for the, so for, the reason. Red law, for the red heifer? Uh, I know there are reasons for the red heifer, according to the son. You know, but a reason does mean that this is the only reason. There is also a reason. After God said that, we're looking for some... What's the, what's the reason for kosher laws? Uh, well, Rambam actually gives a health reason for that. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, I know. I once spoke about it, you know. If it would be health reasons, who would be would have to be the strongest? The Jewish people. Are we the strongest? No. I don't think so. Obviously, it's hard to say that's the only reason, the health reason. Then there is another reason for that, but we'll not go into it. The bottom line is, yeah, I understand, but there is clearly some laws who do not have a reason. The word chok has also another meaning, chakika. Chakika can mean laws, as I said, but chakika can mean engraving. Engraving means to, the word bechukotai could also mean by engraving. What does this mean? We'll understand it better with a story about a Hasidic Jew who lived in America in 1942-43. He came from Russia. His name was Reb Shmuel Levitin. He was one of the most prominent Chabad Hasidim in America in that time. And when the previous Lubavitch Rebbe came to America in 1940, the majority of the Chabad Hasidim were in Chicago. That was the group, the core group. They were the supporters, everything. But the Rebbe settled in New York because New York was the metropolitan of America. That's where the place with the most, the biggest amount of Jews there, and he wanted to influence them. Talking about the previous Lubavitch Rebbe. What he sent in 1942, 43, whenever it was, he sent. Reb Shmuel Levitin, who was like his right hand, if you want, a very prominent host, to go to visit Chicago, to talk to the people, to make some peace there. I don't know what, what it was. Before he left, he came in for a private audience with the Rebbe. The Rebbe told him, when you go to Chicago, there is a Jew there with the name Mr. Risner. Risner. He, the Rebbe says, he is from a Hasidic family. His grandfather was a Hasid. He comes from a... His iches, his genealogy is from Hasidic family. But uh, talk to him, visit him, see what, what he can do. He arrives, he went, at that time he went in a train to Chicago. 
by the train, he arrives to Chicago, the biggest, there was a whole delegation waiting for the personal emissary of the Rebbe, an old Hossi with a long white beard who was in Russian jail for 10 years. He did everything, a few years. He came to Chicago. As he got off the, the plane, it, it, the train, he says, I need to meet Mr. Isner. The Rebbe said I have to meet Mr. Isner, that that's the first thing I'm going to do. Is Mr. Isner, you know him? Is he a member of the Chabad synagogues in Chicago? They look at him and says, yeah, he's a member. Is he coming? He says, yeah, Rosh Hashanah, you keep. <laughs> Not the regular guys. Fine. Where can I meet him? I'm sure you can meet him in his uh, business, in his factory. And the whole delegation is going straight to Mr. Isner's office. I don't think he got uh, any uh, advance notice. This Hasidic rabbi with this long white beard comes in, sits down. He was like overwhelmed. He started to talk. This Hossi knew Mr. Isner's grandfather. He started to talk about the family. He remembered his grandfather, he remembered his father, he remembered his uncle. He told them stories about it. It was an unbelievable meeting. Sitting in the cat, warmed, he warmed up. They, they, they elevated him. I reminded them where he's coming, what his roots are. There comes the end of the meeting. Mr. Isna pulls out his checkbook. He says, to who should I write my uh, donation? Then Rabbi Levitin tells them, Shmuel tells them, oh, I didn't come here for money. And he looks at him, an old rabbi from New York schlepping to Chicago for what? To drink with me a cup of tea? He told them like this. He told them in the Shtetlach, Tell them, I'll tell you what it is. In the Shtetlach used to be a sefer. A sefer means a scribe. In every, every, every Torah, every mezuzah, from time to time has to be checked, to fixed. Letters are being erased, because it's ink and parchment. And after years or after a while, it could be erased. Some people check the mezuzahs, Hasidim check the mezuzahs once a year, in that film. Some people, twice, twice in seven years, it's a Jewish law. And so on and on, the, the Torah, sometimes you can see a letter is erased, you have to fix it. Then in a big city, you have a software and he has enough business for the, from the community. In a, in a shtetl, you cannot support a software that used to be traveling ciphers. Used to go from city to, from shtetl to shtetl, used to fix the Torahs. He tells them, you know, I'm a traveling scribe, he tells them. It's written that the word Israel stands for Yesh shishim ribo otiyot la Torah. The word is that there is 600,000 letters to the Torah. Even in the Torah, there, if you count, you find only 304,000 letters. But with the, with the tagging, with the, uh, all with, with the crowns and so on, that's, 600, that's what the Talmud says, 600,000 letters. What does this mean? Every Jew, there are 600,000 Jews left Egypt. The idea is that every Jew is a letter in the Torah. Every Jew has a connection. In the Torah, it might be your letter. That's why the idea of when you write a new Torah, people buy a letter. Because every Jew is a letter in the Torah. He tells them, you know, I must scribe. Sometimes the letters in the heart of the Jews gets a little erased, you know. The ink is getting a little rubbed off. That I go from, from, from town to town and I fix the letters. I wake up the Jews, I fix the letters that are in the Torah. He was very inspired by this explanation. It was amazing. Fine. He was there a week in Chicago. He came back to New York. The first thing he went to see, to give to the Rebbe a report. He walks in. First thing he spoke about was Mr. Isna, because that's where the Rebbe told him to go. He tells the Rebbe that it was a Mr. Isna, and he tells this, and he proudly told the Rebbe the explanation that he gave to Mr. Isna, that he is like a traveling scribe, and he's fixing the letters in the Torah. And he saw the Rebbe was not so overwhelmed and inspired by this explanation. And he was a very close Hasid that he, he sensed that right away. By the, by, by the Rebbe, you don't have to, don't need explanations. You, you sense in a second that he make the Rebbe like, what's wrong? What's not good about this explanation? The Rebbe told him like this. In the Torah, the ink and the parchment are two separate things. There's the ink and the parchment. And you put them two things together. Therefore, it could be erased. He said, the Jew in the Torah is like the letters of the Ten Commandments, who are engraved in the stone. They are not two separate things that are being attached. 
That's one, when something is engraved in the stone, it's not two things, it's a part of the stone itself. And what could happen? The same thing he says, the Jew in the Torah, it's engraved in them, it can never be erased. What could happen? A little dust. Let's get dusty. Then your job, he tells them, is to go and to clean up the dust. What you don't have to attach to bring something together. There are not two, two, two strange things that you have to attach together. That's them. A Jew and a Torah are one. They are engraved, the Torah is engraved in the Jewish soul. And sometimes only, it could be only a dust. That's called, that's Bechukotai. The Jewish laws, the Torah, and the Judaism is engraved in the Jew. And therefore, we, we are never giving up on the Jew. No matter who the Jew is, we meet him, and he's screaming and yelling, he doesn't want to be a part of Judaism. We don't give up. Why? Because it's there. I don't have to implant in them a love to Judaism. I don't have to introduce them something you never heard. It's a matter of time. You, fight, you come again and again and again until you break through. The Baal Shem Tov said, the, and the verse, Atem Tiu Eretz Chefetz, that the Jewish people are compared to Eretz Chefetz. Eretz Chefetz means a treasured piece of land, a desirable piece of land. There is no, there is pieces of land that are very desirable. You can dig there, you find oil, you find diamonds. What does this mean? The diamond is there. You just need to find it. You don't have to create the diamond, you don't have to implant the diamond. You have to take off the dirt, take off the dust, and bring out the diamond and shine it. That's what the Jewish person is. And that's the first thing about the Chukhoisai. Especially now that we're coming to the holiday of Shavuot soon, and as Shavuot is engraved, we get the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandment, then the Jew needs to know that he has in his heart the Ten Commandments, the, the engraved in, in his soul, Judaism. Now we go to start to learn from inside what's written in, in this week's parasha. If you pursue the study of my laws in order to guard my commandments and observe them, then I will give you rain at a convenient time. The land will yield its produce, and in the future, even the non-fruit-bearing trees of the field will produce fruit. Okay. If you go with my ways and my commandment, I will give you rain in the proper time, in a convenient time. What's the proper time? <clears throat> What's the proper time for rain? The rainy season. No, when you're sleeping or when you're not working, you're not outside. On Friday night. That's the proper time. Because Friday night, nobody's on the road. Everybody has to be home with his family. During the week, people used to be peddlers. People used to go from place to place, traveling. That God doesn't want to make them suffer. They should go in the mud and suffer and schlep. But Friday night, that's the proper time. Because Friday night is a time for every person to be with his family. You stay home. You never, you, you're not traveling anywhere, you're not going anywhere. That if we observe the commandment, not only God will give us rain. He'll give us rain in the most convenient time for us. Never be trouble. Even the rain, the good things will not give us trouble. The reward that's being given is in this world for observing the commandments. Is there also a connection here between observing the commandments and getting a share in the next world? Just the opposite. When you tell most of the Jews you get a share, a share in the world to come, they complain, I want it here, cash. <laughs> you want it in the world to come. That's the Torah speaks here about this world. Not, no, the Torah doesn't speak about afterlife, no. The Torah says you get the reward right now. And more than that, you know, the whole concept of reward, it's not really reward. The reward is to be given in afterlife. Or in the world to come, when Moshiach will come. This is good working conditions. So you hire somebody to do a job for you. You have to give him a computer, you give him a desk, you have to give him a coffee, you have to give him air conditioning, you have to give him a room, you have to give him, the, the, you have to give him a chance to do his work. God gave, hired us, gave us to do mitzvahs, that he gives us good working conditions. I'll give you rain, I'll give you food, I'll give you health, I'll give you money. You should be able to do the mitzvahs. What happens? He gives us all the working condition, and then he says, no. Where are you guys? We don't even show up to, show up to work. You sleep. Oh, I was tired today. You say the 80% of holding a job is just showing up. 
If you don't, if you don't show up, there's nothing to talk about. Then this is not really the reward. This is a God says, if you do what I tell you, I will help you to do more. That's what God is saying here. Okay, let's continue. You will be busy. You will be busy with the threshing until the grape harvest, and the grape harvest will keep you busy until the sowing season. You will be satisfied with even a small amount of your bread, and you will live safely in your land. God gives all the best blessings here. You'll be satisfied with a little bit to eat. You'll not gain weight. You'll not have to run for this. You'll not have to do exercise. And the main thing, you will live safely in your land. Shaftem lo betach ba'atzachem. You should live. Now comes even better blessing. Go ahead, Mark. I will grant peace in the land, and you will go to sleep with nothing frightening you. I will eliminate wild animals from the land, and foreign swords will not even pass through your land in peace, never mind in war. Not only will not be war in the land, we will not even have foreign swords passing by from one place to another. Even the UN peacekeepers will not have to be around, because there will be peace. Everything will work. This is almost like a mini messianic age in a sense. It's a lot of the same things. Yeah, this is messianic age. If you do what Hashem wants, we'll have messianic age. Absolutely. That's the idea. <laughs> I mean, time of Solomon before Moshiach came, we already had it. To a point. Then in certain periods in Jewish history, we had such periods, such period of peace and, and tranquility and everything went worked, worked well. That happened. Go ahead. You will chase away your enemies, and as they are running away, they will fall dead in their own swords before you kill them. You will not even have to kill your enemies. They will fall on their own sword. Go ahead. If you, our weakest man, will be able to chase away a hundred and a hundred, or you will be able to chase away ten thousand. As they are running away, they will fall dead at their own swords before you, despite your tiny army. Basically, what happened in Six Day War, yeah. what happened in 1948, mm -hmm. that the enemies run away before we touched them. Mm -hmm. All the refugees, nobody ever chased them away. They run away on their own because the, the Arab regimes told them, go, move out of the way, we will conquer the land, then you can come back and get the Jewish, even the Jewish houses. That they left, they never came back. Mm -hmm. That's what really happened. And in the uh, Six Day War, they, were, they left the shoes and they ran away. Then that's what this, this, myth was, this promise was fulfilled there. So it sounds like the story of Gideon, too, where 300 soldiers basically routed the whole enemy force. You're right. And the Jewish people, I mean, uh, or, or even better, yeah. yeah. Hezekiah didn't have yeah. to do anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but the same idea. Sure, it's a recurring theme. In history, number, the, yeah, Very, Samson, arguably, as well. Yes, one person who yeah, was killed the whole, the whole uh, Palestine, uh, and King David by killing Goliath killed everybody else. He didn't have to do anything. But it doesn't look like it's it's necessarily correlated with observing all the commandments. Those those particular episodes. I'll tell you, nothing is correlated with exactly with the commandment. You understand? You cannot not always you can see clear the connection. Because there is for certain mitzvahs, as we learned last week, for observing Shemitah, you will sit safely in the land, even if you don't observe other mitzvahs. That's what the Torah says. Here it is a more general rule. And you know, the, also the observing commandment, the commandment is a contract with everybody, you understand? The, we spoke about it a few times, the difference between the first paragraph of Shema and the second paragraph of Shema. The first paragraph of Shema is singular. In Hebrew, there is singular and plural. The second paragraph of Shema is plural. God said about reward and punishment, say, I do the mitzvahs. doesn't work like this. It's not enough that you do the mitzvahs. Everybody has to do the mitzvahs. Then it's very hard to measure it exactly, understand? And more than that, when the Jews do mitzvahs, what, what happened by Samson? The Jews pray to God, save us, save us, save us. The moment they do tshuva, they deserve that. You understand? Then it's, it's more complicated than this. Go ahead. I will turn away from all my affairs to reward you, and I will make you fruitful and into men of stature. I will set up my covenant with you anew. God will make a new covenant, covenant with the Jewish people. A covenant that can never be broken. That the Jews can never break. 
God never breaks his covenant. The Jews can never break it. Go ahead, continue. You will eat matured produce, which will taste better than the fresh produce, and the storage houses will be so full that you will clear out the old crops to make room for the new. The only thing is missing here, and the stock market is going to boom. <laughs> it's going to be just, life will be very, very good. The blessings are amazing. Then comes the more important thing. Go ahead. I will place my dwelling in your midst, and my spirit will not be disgusted by you. That's an interesting expression. <laughs> my spirit will not be disgusted by you. It means to say, God, if we lose the spirit of God, it's not because God did anything. We are just, don't let him be. You know, this, there is a famous Hasidic expression, where is God? Will you let him in? <coughs> <coughs> then will you let him in means, God, God wants, then if we will do the mitzvahs, God will be happy to be among us. But if we don't do the mitzvahs, then God, God doesn't, feel, doesn't, he's not, doesn't feel comfortable by us, among us. That's what, it, what he's talking about. Okay, I will go ahead, continue. When, when you go to heaven, I will stroll among you and you will feel comfortable with me, but I will still be your God whom you fear and you will be my people. I clearly you, you will be my, uh, I will be your God and you will be my people. It goes both ways. And okay, continue. I clearly have the power to bring all these blessings, for I am God, your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt with great miracles, freeing you from their slavery. I broke the pegs of your yoke and led you upright. Led you upright. That's a blessing. There'll be commemute loud saying that goes upright straight towards the land of Israel. The Moshiach will come, will go up like this. Proud. Be proud, Jews. So far, it's such blessings. It's a pleasure. But what's the new covenant that's being talked about here? The Moshiach will come, so to speak, be a new covenant with the Jewish people. A covenant can never be broken by Co people. A covenant is simply a, a new agreement. There are lots of new covenants in Jewish thought. I mean, yeah. they, they keep adding, piling up layers of covenants. <laughs> right. Obviously, you need another one. <laughs> but this, um, is the, this is the Messianic covenant? That's being I think about. so. What means a new one? What means a new one? A new one, um, Ashi said it, yeah. Bris Chadosha. Yeah. A new one means then when the air will be, will be not like the old covenant that was broken by God throwing out the Jews in the land of Israel, but Jews not being observing the mitzvahs and so on. Be a covenant that can never be broken. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because uh, uh, the half Torah that we do from Jeremiah for this section is from Jeremiah 32. But uh, Jeremiah talks about a new covenant in 31. You would think that that would have been, they, they would have extended the half Torah. Now you're asking me why they choose this half Torah. I cannot tell you this answer. Yeah. Yeah, Jeremiah steps in 32. I think because it also speaks about uh, some the sins of Judah, and this is the, as we're going to learn. Now, the next part of the of the, the next parsha, the next uh, here it starts: consequences of failing to observe the mitzvahs. We are not going to read it. Why not? Why not? Why we are not going to read it? Because even when we read it in the synagogue, the custom is that this aliyah, the reader gets the aliyah. Why the reader gets the aliyah? Because this is like you, and it should happen to you and you, that the guy that you hate in shul the most, <laughs> oh, oh, I want to live for you, come here. <coughs> and the, the reader was saying, you should happen this, and you should happen. Therefore, when the reader reads it by himself, it doesn't mean it for himself, it doesn't mean on anybody. Now, the other thing is, not only you read it by yourself, the, even the reader is not being called up to the aliyah. He just says the blessing. You don't invite him to read the talk. And then you read it a little bit in a lower tone because it's curses. There is twice in the Torah curses, once here, before Shavuos, and one before Rosh Hashanah. Before we, we in Parshat um, Kitavo. There is a story about the second Chabad Rebbe. In those Parshat Kesova, there is even more curses, and I think double the amount of him, that he, once his, fa his father, usually the Alter Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe, used to read the Torah. Every Shabbos. 
once he was out of town, he had to go somewhere. And somebody else read the Torah. But the son, who was later the Rebbe, heard that curses, he fainted. He was so sick that it was a question if he can fast on Yom Kippur. Even that Kitta was like two weeks before Yom Kippur, more than two weeks, two and a half weeks. They, they, they were not sure if he can fast Yom Kippur. So they asked him, it's the first time you heard the news, what is this? You heard it last year, two years ago, three years ago, what happened? That he says, when my father reads, you don't have curses, your blessings. What does this mean? When a tzaddik reads, somebody who loves the Jewish people reads, you don't have curses. You, it's, it's a different meaning. And it's actually Kabbalah teaches us how we, we can find in every one of them, it's like hidden blessings. There is certain blessings that cannot be expressed because maybe the Satan will be jealous. It will not allow it to happen. Then you hide it in a secret code. It looks like curses, but really it's blessings. And there is a famous story with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. He told his son, Rabbi Lozo, to go to ask for a blessing for somebody. And it looked like a curse. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai explained him why it's a blessing. The same thing is here. Then the, the, but on the, on the simple text, it looks like a curse, not a blessing. Then we will skip the, cur the curses. You can come to Shul Shabbos if you really want to hear it. Um, and we'll go to page 837. And here, on, on 44, in page 837, number 44, we'll read it. Because here comes, within the curses, there comes some like a, a the Hashem ends the story with an, a very optimistic note. You want to read? Page 837, number 44. But... But despite all this above-mentioned punishment while they are in the enemy's land, I will not despise them and become uh, disgusted by them to the extent that I annihilate them, breaking my covenant that is with them, for I am God, their God. Okay, let's stop right here. Even when they are in the, in the land of their enemies, what you mentioned before, I will never give up on them. I will not get rid of them to break the covenant that I made with the, with the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as he's going to, he mentioned before, in number 42 actually, but I will remember my covenant with Yaakov and my covenant with Yitzchak and my, and, uh, too. I will also remember my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land. That God mentions Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. An interesting thing, God mentioned this in the opposite way. Jacob, then Isaac, then Avram. Really, it should go, Rashi is asking it. It should be Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's Avram. We start the Amida. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. Why is it going upside down? Because God says, I will remember the covenant of Jacob. If this is not enough, it will be the covenant of Isaac. If this is not enough, the covenant of Abraham. That I made with Abraham. And Rashi points out that in this covenant, there, it's interesting about Jacob and Abraham, the Torah is using the word remembering. I remember the covenant of Jacob. And then he says the same thing, I remember, uh, I'll rem I remem I remember the covenant with Abraham, but by Isaac it's not written remember. The word remember is not written by Isaac. The Rashi is pointing out, why not by Isaac remembering? The Rashi says something very interesting. And here is something that it's unusual. I'll tell you why. Why it's um, why God, um, Mark? You can, uh, then I rem because he says the uh, the 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 language Rash is using the ashes of Isaac is on the altar. It doesn't need to be remembered. That's right there. What does this mean? Isaac was ready to be sacrificed, right? Then the meat, he almost was sacrificed, right? That this, that this self sacrifice that Isaac had is always in front of the eyes of God. No need for remembrance. You understand what I'm saying? Abraham's covenant, we have to remember. Jacob's covenant, we have to remember. Isaac's covenant, we don't have to remember. Why? Because he was ready. What, what lies behind it? He was ready to sacrifice his life. He 
<laughs> it's all about sacrificing, yeah. But the translation is not. Why? I read it. No? It doesn't say remember. It's a, he says I remember both. No, I don't, yeah, but the word remember is not written. It's written by Abraham. Vavid Briti Avram Esko. It's written Zacharti by Jacob. And it's written. I know, I know. It says both. No, it's not, okay. not, not written the word Zacharti by so Isaac. Because Zacharti is not written there. Yeah, that's what Rashi points out. Okay. Look the Rashi down. The former. Zacharti et Briti, the second column. Zacharti, Lama, um, Lama lo neemra schira be Yitzchak, Ela afaro shel Yitzchak nere lefana yitzavur umunach al gabi hamizbeach. The second column, the, the third and fourth line. Second column from the right. From the, yeah, right there, right there. Beautiful. Go down, 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 down. Right here, yes. Okay. Then, then what, what, what does this mean? What, the Shems, what Rashi says there, Isaac no need, no, no need to be remembered because he was ready to give his life. And this is something, sacrifice, that's what it's all about. Sacrifice doesn't have to mean that you have to jump off the roof and be burned alive, God forbid. Sacrifice means that you are ready to sacrifice something from your life. And that's what counts. In every story in the Bible, in every story in Jewish history, who is remembered? The people who are ready to sacrifice. Who accomplished the people ready to sacrifice? And if it's a if it's a, if it's a splitting of the sea, if Nachshon ben Nachshon ben Aminada wouldn't jump into the water, we would still be waiting there by the water until today. It's all about somebody who is ready to jump into the water, physically, spiritually, psychologically, no matter how you slice it. If Esther wouldn't risk her life to go to the king, why she knows she can be killed? Who knows what would happen? And the same thing is here with Isaac. Now, what's interesting here is, usually, the Akeda, who we, talk, who we say that, who, had, who, who gets the credit for the Akeda, for the sacrificing of Isaac? Abraham. The test of Abraham, every time. The test of Abraham, the test of Abraham. Mm -hmm. Here is, I think, the only time that Isaac is getting credit for it, not Abraham. Hmm. I never thought about it. Always it's Abraham. The whole story from the Akedah, Hashem told Abraham, and he said, in Naini, I'm ready to go, and it's understood why Abraham. Because Abraham, sacrificing his son, it was the same as his belief, his religion, everything would be destroyed. Usually we say, why, why? We always ask why Isaac doesn't get credit for it. Because Isaac was, a, Isaac was ready to go no matter what. Here is, I think, the only place, I think, that Isaac is getting credit for it, not Abraham. Hashem says, the Isaac sacrifice is remembered in front of me. It does need to be remembered. I always remember. So in the rabbinic literature, Isaac gets a lot of credit. <laughs> Lots of midrashim. Yeah, but every time when you when, when you daven on Rosh Hashanah, even you read from the Torah, we remember every time the story from the Akedah and so on. Every day in the morning, it's usually Abraham gets the credit. Isaac never. Finally, I found a place in the Bible. Isaac getting some credit. He deserves credit. He deserves a lot of credit. He was an adult, and he chose to be sacrificed. This was his decision? Sure. God told Abraham, and Abraham told Isaac. Isaac asked them, by the way, who is going to be the sacrifice? He told them, by the way, God told me you. Kind of hinted to him. And Isaac went and continued to walk like he never, he didn't have anything, any special news. Oh, me, fine. Isaac can tell him, you know, above all, Father, if Hashem wants to make me, to, I should sacrifice myself, why he didn't come to me? He didn't ask any questions. Whatever Hashem wants, that's what I'm going to do. And that's what, I, that's what the specialty of Isaac. And that's why he says that even in the land of my enemies, I will never forget them. And I will never get rid of them because, because I made a covenant with them. And he says in number 45, I will remember, continue. What, uh I just wanted to point out there, yeah. there mention ask you that there's a in, a in a parsha where there's a lot of stuff packed in, there seems to be a lot of stuff packed into this verse forty two. In addition to Yaakov, um, Remember first, the land. Um, he also um, has an extra vault in his Yeah, name. yeah, yeah. Rashi brings Rashi speaks about it. 
They, you're right. This is one of the places it's interesting that it would be in the same sentence based on what you're pointing out. The extra above, Rashi says something very interesting. The name Yaakov, usually you write Yud Ein Kuf Bet. Here it's written Yud Ein Kuf Vav Bet, Yaakov. Why is an extra Vav? And the Rashi points out there is five places in the Bible that Yaakov is written with an extra Vav, the letter Vav. And there is five places in the Bible that Elijah, Eliyahu, is written without a Vav. It's written Eliyah. The Vav is missing. The Shrashi brings down the Talmud that says that Jacob took from Elijah the prophet, Elijah's job is to come to tell us that the Moshiach is coming, to bring the final redemption. Then Jacob, so to speak, took from, Je from, from uh, Elijah something to hold on to, a collateral of the Vav to tell him until, until you bring me, until you finally, you, you bring the, uh, the promise you deliver the Jewish people and the coming of Moshiach. Then you get your Vav back, so to speak. That's why he says that that's, that, that's the extra war. You're right. It's, it's a, and he says also to remember the land, not only to remember the people. So it's all juxtaposed. I mean, it's all in the same, the same, the same pasuk. Yes, yes, yes. Number 45. I will remember. I will remember for their sake the covenant made with the <clears throat> original tribes whom I took out from the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations so as to be a God to them. I am God. Mm -hmm. These are the super rational and rational commands from the written and oral laws that God gave through Moshe on Mount Sinai as a covenant between himself and the children of Israel. Here is, here is in this parsha the reward, the punishment, it's all here. The, deal, the, the contract is right here in this week's parsha. The Chukoy say. Now, the next part of the parsha speaks about uh, measurement. Before we go ahead, there, please. Uh, Nachmanides made a comment about this, that this particular passage applied to the Babylonian exile, and then Deuteronomy chapter 28 then applied to the Roman exile that we're currently in. I was wondering if you could comment about that. I think there is a Talmudic statement, if I remember correct. I did not, the, Medre, the Rabbi Judah, the, the prince says it, or in today's world, you can find it online in a second. I'll tell you in a minute. Um, who says it? Do you have the Bible.com app? Here it is. Um, here it is. Oh, it's not opening. What is this? What is it's not, for some reason, it's not. Uh, oh, here it is. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't let it, I don't let them even. Don't give him a chance, basically. He says, it's in the name of Shmuel, the Amora Shmuel, who says, um, okay, the, the, the Gemara says in Megillah, it says like this, Shmuel said, on this verse, um, even in the, land, uh, uh, in the land of the enemies, Loi me asked him, when, is, when I didn't discuss them, I, uh, I was not, I didn't spy them in the, in the, in the years, in the time of the Greeks. And I didn't get disgusted by them in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian exile. To, to, this, to annihilate them. When was the, when was that question of annihilation? Purim. To stop my, to, to give up the covenant with them, to, to uh, deny the covenant that I had with them in the time of the Persians. Because I am the God, I will bring them uh, in the time of Moshiach. And then, he, and then he says in the name of the Mishnah, another explanation, a similar thing. I didn't forget about them in the time when I sent them Hananiah, Meshach, and Nazaria. 
the three people were ready to be thrown into the, into the, fur, into the furnace, right? And then, I, and then I, I sent them, in the time of the Greeks, I sent them Shimon HaTzadik and, uh, and the Maccabees. And then it says, in the, uh, uh, and later I sent them Mordechai and Esther to help them. And then, and then, and then I sent them the people of, of Rebbe and the, all, the, all the rabbis in the Jewish history. That no, they'll never be lost. Then this statement, this speaks about everything. You understand? Not just about the, you see Nachmadi says that this is speaking about what? The, the Babylonian exile. It's basically, that's what I'm saying, that's straight from the Talmud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you understand? Then the Talmud speaks, takes this verse and, and, and learns that, that about all the generations and all the history, God will never forget the Jewish people. That's what it really is. That's one part of the of the of this sixth portion. Now we'll go to the next part. Next part is about on page eight thirty seven, evaluation of dedication to the temple. I mean now what? Um, We'll go to the end of the Parsha, page 843. The tithe of animals. You read? Okay. When a, person, when a person comes to tithe his animals and they come out from an entrance one after the other, the tenth animal that passes under the rod will be the tithe of the cattle or the flock. You know, there is a tight animal. You have to give the, the tent of, or your tent animal, you have to give for God. That you let them go out from the, from your, uh, from the cattle where they're sitting and you count one, two, three, the number 10. You, you make a sign of him that he has, he has to be the, be given, given to the temple. So go for sacrifice. Yes. No the matter the if basement. it's perfect or not. Not for no for sacrifice has to be perfect. If not, it yeah. cannot it cannot so. be sacrificed. But it can be given to the coin. But it, that's sort of a strange thing because we always see that we're always supposed to give the best to Hashem. That was the whole problem with Abel and Cain. You see that in other situations and things. That's when Hashem tells you. But if Hashem tells you that you should give number ten, that's number ten. Okay. It's yeah. number ten has a certain holiness to it. Yeah, sure it does. Like like in people, the person who makes the minion is a certain holiness. a siri ye kodesh. The line, the expression when used by a synagogue, when somebody, the tent person walks in, we say the tent is holy, comes from here about the animals. That the tent becomes holy because it's number 10. Does make a difference how, how, if it's the best or not the best. Look at the next line. Continue. Go ahead. Despite. Despite the fact that sacrifices are generally offered from the best animals, he should not select a good unblemished animal or a bad blemished one for the tithe animal, nor should he offer a substitute for it. The idea that I wanted to point out here, you should not, you should not substitute. You shouldn't say I will give a good one for a bad one. Why not? The tent animal is a shvach animal. Eh? I want to bring a big, good, fed, good, great animal to the temple to honor God. Why not? Why not to substitute good for bad? What's wrong? God said, take number ten. Well, it's sort of. Well, it's also sort of like on Shabbos, you, you're not allowed to separate the good from the bad, you know. That's a, different, that's a different story. Why not to substitute a good animal for a bad animal? What's wrong with that? I want to bring something better. And the Torah says if you substitute it, you have to bring both to the temple. You cannot give up on one and not have the other. Right? Shem controls which one's the temple. 
The answer is because if you substitute the good for the bad, you'll end up to substituting the bad for the good. Hmm? That's how it starts, always. Just like with the mitzvahs, we say in the Torah, I think it's the Turanami, in Parshas Rei, we say, Loito isifu v'loi sigru, right? Where is it written? Do not add and do not uh, um, subtract from the Torah. Parshas Rei. Where is this written? Loito isifu v'loi sigru. Can you say it, sir? Yeah, that's the Turanami. Oh, here it is. It's one place at least. Page 1209. It's written here, number one. Chapter 13, number one. Be careful. Read it. Be careful to observe everything which I am commanding you, no matter how trivial it may seem. Do not add to it. Do not detract from it. Then the Talmud is asking, do not add, do not detract. What should be the right way to be written? Do not distract. That's, a, that's the danger. And do not add to it. Then the Talmud says, a person, when the, the, a person doesn't start with taking off something from the Torah. The Yitzhak will not even tell them, will not walk. The evil inclination comes and tell them, don't do a mitzvah. They'll say, are you crazy? Sure I'm going to do it. He tells them, let's do it more. Let's add a mitzvah. You know what Rashi brings the example for adding a mitzvah? Right there? Read, read uh, on page 12 or 9, how might one add, uh, add to the Torah? Rashi. Read it, read it, read it, yeah. Well, where is it? Right there, right there, yes. Oh, right oh, in the bottom left. No, no, in top, top, top. Okay. Oh. In top the classic there. question, you see it? The classic question, look in top of the page underneath the mm -hmm. text. Yeah. Be careful, Rashi, to fill in with five tosafos, yeah. five species in the lulav, or four blessings uh, for the priestly blessing. You will add four, chap four parchments in the film. I want to put five. Four spices for, for, for the lulav. I'll put five. What's wrong? No. The more, the merrier, right? I want to say in English. The better. You'll start with more. What's the problem you start with more? You can subtract so, later uh, because... You be, it becomes your business. Ah, I can add. I can return stock. I can do whatever I want. The same thing the Torah says in our parsha. Don't do me any favors. Give this point to the temple. Don't substitute from good to bad. Because eventually, when you start to substitute, you'll substitute better. How does adding you, fences square with this? Beautiful. That's what I wanted to say. In Judaism, you know, anything that the Talmud came up with, the rabbis came up, they didn't just came up with an idea. Oh, you know what? Let's do fences. You know, Judy, the, the Talmud, the rabbis are full with fences, right? All day we make fences to the Torah. Don't do this because you may think, what's mukze? Don't touch a pen because you might write with it. The whole concept of mukze and Shabbat is a fence. <coughs> Where is the source for the rabbi's idea for fences? That that's what I learned from the Rebbe this week. This is one of the sources. Do not substitute the good for the bad because you learned that to substitute bad for the good. Here the Rebbe says it's one of the places you can show that the, the Torah itself is making fences. Where there is another place in the Torah that you make fences to make a fence? In the Torah? Which mitzvah is a fence in the Torah beside this? This is a perfect example. Very good, and good thing. Physical fence or on the roof? Huh? On the roof. No, you? that's a roof. It's a, it's a physical fence. I'm talking yeah. about a fence. Don't do A because you might do B. No? Think. Where in the Torah there is a mitzvah that you only do it because you might lose it? 
might forget. Chometz and Pesach. You're not allowed to have Chometz in your house. Why not? Because you might forget and eat it. Then the Torah itself is making it as a fence. Le Chometz should not be found Chometz in your house. Because if you might, if, might, if, I, if you be Chometz, what, what's the problem? I'm not allowed to eat Chometz. Fine. Why, why, why cannot be Chometz in my house? Because you might forget. Another example with the Torah is making a fence uh, just, just in case you make a mistake. And there is another example. That's a little loud one. Okay. There is a... Huh? There's several. For example? Well, the, I think one that's interesting is uh, you, can't, you can't have uh, cheese on chicken or something. That's the rabbis made the fence. I'm talking about oh, places the Torah, the Torah itself oh, made the fence. Okay. The, how many lashes? The lashes the means there's a law in Torah. Oh, how many oh, lashes? Oh, oh, it's supposed to be 40. 40. It's What's to be 40. written? Written on 40. 40. 40. Yeah. Why we give 39? The Torah says you should because you learn from the be, Torah. Because you should. Because who might be a mistake, you might give one extra. Therefore, we go one less. That's another example of the idea of offense, offense to the Torah. And this idea, do not substitute good for the bad and bad for the good. And but, it's also, what? Well, but we do see enhancements and beautifying of mitzvahs, but the best example would be Hanukkah. We were supposed to only have to light one candle each day in each member, and then it gets added no, no, on. No, 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 no. The mitzvah itself has three options. Yeah, but there the was the primary mission, and then, then the Hillel and Beishemah and all those different things. First of all, Hanukkah is a rabbinic mitzvah to begin with. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. Number two, even when you add something, as long as you know that you did, it's not a biblical thing, it's something that you make to enhance the mitzvah, that's a different story. You understand? Or the new task start to move around the mitzvah, to change the mitzvah, that's a problem. But uh, in Hanukkah, the rabbis in the set of the mitzvah, they made the three options. It's an unusual thing, by the way, to have different options of observing a mitzvah. You see it only in Hanukkah. I don't recall any other place that has, a, that has two options to do the mitzvah. You can do it this way and this way. What is this? That's a mitzvah and finished. It's only in Hanukkah we have this idea. But the idea is also in spiritual life. Do not substitute and think that I'll give God a better job. I'll do for God something even more. But that's a simple, too simple. I'm not going to do this. I'll do for God a more, a more important job. If that's what demanded now from you, that's what you need to do. If somebody needs a minion now, that's 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 the mitzvah of the minute. But I'll go, I'll do a bigger mitzvah. Don't 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 do don't do business with God. Don't give him one mitzvah for the other. Did we see that with King Saul, where he said uh, he spared the animals from the, from the uh, that he was supposed to kill, and he said, oh, I saved the animals, so I can give you a sacrifice." Very good example. King Saul fell on this thing. King Saul said, when Samuel came to him and told him. No, he says, Akimoy Sidvar Hashem, I fulfilled the will, the will of God, he said. Told them, what's the voice says that I hear the noise? I said, oh yeah, I did it for the, for the sake of God. Exactly, what, King, what, what Samuel told them, God needs sacrifice, God needs people, listen to him. And that's exactly what the message is, from this, from, from not, not substituting. If we have to learn to do what God is asking from us to do. And that's the only way we can connect to God. Because the moment I do what I want, it's not anymore what God wants. The relationship with God, you ask him your child a cup of water, and instead he's going to give you to do something else. You ask him, do your own work. He says, no, 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 I'll bring a cup of tea. I didn't ask you for a cup of tea. I said, do your own work, right? That when he's doing what you ask from him, then there is a relationship. The moment he's doing what he wants, there is no more relationship. The relationship with God is when we do what Hashem asks from us. The moment we start to switch things around, that's already, it's your religion, it has nothing to do with God. He say, that's now it's your will, it has nothing to do with me, I never asked you to do this. How do we reconcile that with rabbinic law where we do add a lot of things? I mean, it's not biblical law, but I mean, we set up different As categories long, of law. Because, because the rabbis in the Torah, God gave the rabbis the power to add things. Then it's also within the frame of, and like this example with the fence, Everything that the rabbis made has a similar thing inside the, inside the Torah. 
every law, you look good, they will always find the source for it somewhere in the Torah. Somehow it's already there in uh, the same idea. But besides that, the rabbi is more empowered in the Torah to make it. It's again a part of the Torah. Understand? They don't just do one money get up and start to do things. There's a mitzvah to remember miracles. There's a mitzvah of Hanukkah is to remember the mitzvah. But the idea of to remember miracles, that's from the Torah. We have to remember the mitzvah of Egypt, right? The Exodus of Egypt, because God made us a miracle. That, they, that from them they took the idea to remember every miracle. We have to thank God. That's a mitzvah in the Torah to thank God. Then, then we learn to thank God. There is a sacrifice, a, a, a thanksgiving, thanksgiving sacrifice. Then the, all it's based on the Torah, you understand? They didn't come up with, with a new thing. Then the, this is the lesson that we have to remember. God tells me something to do, just do it. <laughs>